Hi, everybody. Tom Woods here. Very glad to be joined once again by Jim Epstein, who is managing editor of Reason TV and The Reason Podcast. And he's just put out a really superb piece of journalism. And I think it's important, particularly given that libertarians are often given to abstract theorizing. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but I think we connect with people more effectively when we focus on particular case studies and real flesh and blood human beings. And that's what Jim's done here in talking about the consequences of the coming $15 minimum wage for New York. And in particular, he focuses in this piece on car washes and what it's meant for a lot of people and the kinds of consequences. We're supposed to call them unintended consequences. And I'll give them the benefit of the doubt that maybe they didn't realize that it would have these effects on people. But it has real and clear and lasting and uh, very damaging effects on very real people. And this is very skillfully shown in this video. So definitely you'll want to watch it. It's at tomwoods.com slash 1266. And I thought it would make a good topic of conversation. Jim, welcome back. Uh, thank you, Tom. Thrilled to be back on. And, you know, my kids have been saying to me for months that nobody wants to hear me talk about car washes. So thank you for proving them wrong. Oh, I'm they on are. the Tom Wood show. Yeah, yeah. They, you're darn right. Yeah, darn right. I, they are so wrong. I'm sure they're wonderful kids. But on this, we have refuted them because I am really, really interested in what you've been doing on this, your most recent video. It's so well done. It's just devastatingly Thank well you. done. So let's start a, a little bit earlier. Let's go back a few years. You were telling me in an email briefing that it was in 2015 that you first became interested in labor reporting because the New York Times had done a series on exploitation at nail salons. And uh, you say that this piece was a Pulitzer Prize finalist, made a big splash. And the gist of it was... You can have something decadent for a cheap price only by somebody being exploited. And so you responded to this. So you went in and tried to give another side of the story. So what was their story? What was your story? Yeah, this was it was a series called Unvarnished that ran in The New York Times in 2015. And it not only was a Pulitzer finalist, it made a huge splash, but it actually led to policy change. Uh, Governor Cuomo reacted by creating a labor task force and starting to really crack down on New York nail salons. So it had amazing impact. And I was getting interested in the story. And, you know, really sort of the big picture was that I realized that most people writing about these issues, most reporters were coming at it with this assumption, this almost cartoonish world of evil bosses and exploited workers that they were fitting the facts into over and over again. And actually, as you, you just alluded to, the reporter of that nail salon piece, whose name is Sarah Maslin-Nier, had been interviewed about it. And I think the interviewer had asked her, what's the big takeaway? What is the greatest lesson from your series? And her quote was, there's no such thing as a cheap luxury. The only way you can have something decadent for a cheap price is by someone being exploited. And a liberal arts education these days might lead people to come away with that impression. But anyone who's actually run a successful business knows that the most important thing is keeping your employees, your good employees happy because good people are very hard to find and they are the cornerstone of any successful business. So at a car wash, you know, a person who who gets there on time every morning and is reliable and has too much integrity to let a car pull out of the wash with a streak on the side. That is what a good business is built on. So actually, the power dynamic often goes the other way. And the other thing is, I mean, it's not to say that there are not abusive bosses and bad situations as there are in any workplace at any level occasionally. But the way to deal with that is to give people more choices. You lower barriers to entry. You make business more competitive so that those workers have other work options. And the bad operators, people that mistreat their employees, are going to go out of business. And of course, the reaction, the government's approach to dealing with these issues and its reaction is really just to raise barriers to entry through regulation and to make the exact problem worse. It's really interesting to see that 
the person who at that time was the New York Times public editor, Margaret Sullivan, felt compelled to address your criticisms of their series. And she wrote in the Times, these are her words, that the series went too far in generalizing about an entire industry. Its findings and the language used to express them should have been dialed back in some instances substantially. That's got to be satisfying. You know, it was, in a sense, it was sort of an easy target because I knew that the reporter had gone about her reporting, making the facts conform to her preconceived narrative. So once I started calling all the people that she had talked to and actually looking at all the evidence, I found that almost everything was wrong. Almost everyone had said they were misquoted. It was completely misconstrued. And actually, probably the biggest thing, and this is the great lie in labor reporting, is that labor activists are always saying, oh, well, they're paying slave wages. You know, they're making $4 a day. And actually what goes on is most of low wage workers are paid in cash and they're paid off the books. So, and they actually prefer it that way for a variety of reasons. One of which is that uh, it helps them stay eligible for food stamps and other programs. So it's great to have your money now and to be paid off the books. But then when enterprising journalists or labor inspectors show up, the books are a mess. And you can pretty much allege anything, really. And then, you know, the fines really mount up. So that was sort of the main error that this reporter made. And there's another preconceived notion that I came across when working on that story, which is that there's this patronizing assumption at the root of all this labor reporting. I remember I I called an attorney who was representing a nail salon manicurist who had claimed that she was experiencing a grinding existence, making $3 a day, and she'd stayed at this same job for four years. Now, I I visited that nail salon. I, I got their prices. I tried to figure out how could she make $3 a day? And the only way would have been if she'd been maybe servicing one client a week sitting around all day. And it just, it just didn't add up. And I said to the, the attorney, you know, this doesn't sound like a grinding existence. And why didn't she look for a nail salon with more foot traffic? And his response, I remember, was like, he said very explicitly, well, these people are very unsophisticated and they're really incapable of acting in their own best interest. And so that is the other assumption that people make, which is that low wage workers are unsophisticated. And so we need to come in and help them because we know better the the set of trade-offs that they face, um, which of course is completely wrong. These people are savvy and they know what's in their own best interest. And that actually reminds me of one of the workers in the video we're eventually going to get to who was talking about union representation. And he's saying, in effect, what do I need this for? I don't have any problems here. And if I want to work somewhere else, I'll just go work somewhere else. I mean, it was just very simple, kind of man on the street, common sense answer. Now you write While reporting that story, I realized that labor enforcement in New York is a political racket. What do you mean by that? So the other thing, and this is something that people that study the impact of the minimum wage often miss. And I'm very heavily focused on New York because I want to do detailed reporting. In New York City, at least, enforcement is incredibly weak. So, you know, the minimum wage has an impact because there are many employers who who abide by it and it is bringing big changes. But there are big parts of the industry, often in immigrant neighborhoods, immigrant owned businesses where they pay cash and they don't abide by it at all. And they do that because they can completely get away with it. The Federal Department of Labor actually cannot enforce the $15 minimum wage because it's state law. They can only enforce the federal minimum wage, which is less than half of that. The State Department of Labor enforces it, and it is a complete backwater. I think there's maybe 100 inspectors when they last looked at this statewide. They really never show up. So in one sense, this is kind of a blessing because it means that all of these doom scenarios probably won't come true and these crazy laws won't lead to mass unemployment. Of course, the leftists who claim that, you know, the minimum wage has no impact are going to feel think they're vindicated because of this. However, the way it actually works is that it creates a weapon for politicians so they can, when they want, come down on a business or an operator by directing the department of labor to go after them. So that sort of discretionary aspect of it is sort of one of the real scandals here. So it happened with the nail salons, right? So this error riddled series made a big splash. 
And then I think within the week, Governor Cuomo had created a task force and the task force started showing up at all these mom and pop immigrant owned nail salons, which were paying off the books. Some of them didn't know all the very complex labor laws in New York. They started getting tens of thousands of dollars in fines. The Chinese owners in particular actually had a WeChat group where they would alert each other to when the inspectors were coming. So they actually got pretty savvy and then they would, you know, immediately close shop, et cetera. But that's a perfect example example of how this discretionary aspect really gives politicians a lot of power. Right, right, right. So in other words, it's a situation where it's an unstated piece of knowledge that both sides have that the enforcement of this is spotty. You know it and we know it. But what you equally know is that therefore, as you put it, we can weaponize these labor regulations anytime we want to, and we can weaponize them and use them against groups that have very little political clout, like Chinese and Korean business owners. So yeah, as you say, it's good that they're not able to enforce it completely because that blunts some of the negative consequences. But on the other hand, it means they can really target it. It can, it becomes like a Kafka novel and it's just, anyway. So, all right. So let's talk now about the car wash issue, because then you moved into the issue of car washes. We did some work on this a couple of years ago that you've just recently followed up on to look at the consequences of the, I guess, $15 minimum wage. And I I spend a lot of time in New York, but I try to avoid New York politics. How long has there been a $15 minimum wage in New York? Well, it's actually, there is not one yet. It's it's oh, coming in. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it takes full effect. It's a gradual thing. Right. Um, it's almost there. It takes full effect in January of 2019. Uh, but of course, oh, it's coming. it has been going up every year. So, and of course, the owners are preparing for it. The other thing that's been going on is that the $15 minimum wage is one thing that lessens its impact is that certain industries, restaurants included, can take what's called a tip credit, which means that if you're employed employees are making a certain amount of tips per hour, then you can pay less than the minimum wage. You can get credited for a portion of the tips. So that has always been a factor. A lot of owners don't even bother, particularly restaurants, because it's very complicated when tips apply or when they don't. So you you really leave yourself open because inspectors could basically show up at any restaurant and find violations because it's impossible to abide by all of them perfectly. However, that's a factor. But now there's a big movement in New York to eliminate the tip credit. So that won't eat. So that, mm. again, amounts to a really big increase. So the $15 minimum wage has been coming for a long time. And car wash owners have been preparing for it. And of course, the main thing that I found is they're automating and they're closing down. And these are the car wash owners that really take the, they've either been targeted, they've had Department of Labor investigations, they have assets that they need to protect. They're going to do whatever they can to abide by the law. That's not the entire industry. But so this is what the impact has been. And one thing that I found so interesting about New York is that this move towards automation in car washes um, really got going in the 70s when a company called Sherman came out with much better equipment. And then it accelerated further in the early aughts. I think it was about 2001 when an operator in Baton Rouge came up with a model where you vacuum your own car um, and you just go through a tunnel. So you really need almost no workers on site. And this was a big innovation that swept the country. However, New York has never been part of this. In fact, what was happening in New York in the 80s were that car washes were actually de-automating. They were ripping out their machines. And so there's always there's this idea somehow that automation is like a march forward, but it's not. In the 80s, car wash operators found that New York customers, they love the hand wash. They loved when guys, you know, take lots of care with their beautiful cars and do detailing work. You know, they worry that machines are going to scratch their cars. And there was a lot of profit to be made. There was also a huge immigrant population that was coming in, many of them illegal. So there was a workforce, unlike in many other, that, that was also true in Southern California, not true in most parts of the country. So now what's happening now with the $15 minimum is we're reversing sort of the de-automation of the 80s. And of course, what does it mean? Fewer jobs. Now that, that really is interesting because there are cases, of course, where, as you say, people prefer things not to be automated, but also there are times when People will say, uh, well, they'll look at increased uh, automation. They'll think that maybe this is a good thing, that it leads to more efficiency. But it's if it's artificially chosen and the two options of labor intensive versus labor unintensive are not given a level playing field, 
you're not going to have the the optimal result. And this seems to be a case of that. So that's one thing people could have predicted, that they would automate, because that's what a lot of industries do when faced with increased labor costs. Yeah, I mean, automation is, a, in many cases, it is a downgrade in services at New York car washes, which they can now kind of get away with because of the $15 minimum. And you know, the optimal situation is what two parties agree on. You know, customers and car wash owners have a certain arrangement. And if the customers prefer hand washes, that's the optimal situation. You know, I think you're right. We, we always encounter this bias that somehow machines replacing men is just the march of progress. Not necessarily. It's what consumers want. Or I've even heard it said that, well, one benefit of crime in the U.S. is that Americans are leading the world in crime prevention technology. Well, OK, but I would rather just have no crime and, no, you know, like, this seems kind of a convoluted way to look at it. But yeah. what, what you're seeing now, though, in the current video is stuff that wouldn't be as easy to anticipate, namely the black market that's developing and also the way that the $15 minimum wage benefits certain types of providers and is a problem for other types of providers. So can you sort all that out? As I said earlier, enforcement is weak, you know, so the industry is pretty much divided. So a big portion of the industry doesn't care what the minimum wage is. They're continuing to pay cash and they're the black market operators. There's also a segment that I really focused on in the video of those illegal car washes where they're actually just they're guys that are setting up vans on the street and they're very uh, in. They have generators on the street and, and handheld sprayers. Um, it's sort of ingenious how they're doing it. And it, this is a growing phenomenon. So customers still prefer hand washes. So you have a sort of this growing uh, black market. So of course, as you know, when you over-regulate something, and that's what the $15 minimum wage amounts to, what you do is you breed black markets because particularly when enforcement is weak, because this is what customers want and you have able-bodied men who want to do this work. So really, again, it's another example of how the interventions that the labor activists are pushing lead to the exact opposite consequences. So instead, you have a larger black market, which is all cash, and there's no workman's comp, there's no insurance if somebody's injured, you know, there's no, it's just completely unregulated. So that's happening. And then you have the established car wash workers, some of whom recognize that the $15 minimum wage has some benefits for them, because it, in order to now stay open, because you really can't affordably wash a car and do a hand wash at $15 an hour, you're, you your customers won't pay that much. They've realized to stay in business, the ones that want to stay in business, they have to install all sorts of new machinery. That's costly, it's difficult, and it raises the barriers to entry in the industry. So some of them have actually reflected and said, you know, this is a good thing because it means that a guy can't open a hand wash on the corner and steal my customers. I can go fully automated. And so many of them want to do that because they think that dealing with labor and workers is headaches. Consumers, it benefits consumers, but it doesn't really benefit them. They'd much rather just have a machine just working around the clock and never complaining. So of course, though, since there are still the illegal hand washes, these car wash owners are now sort of banded together with the union and the labor activists to advocate for shutting them down. We need to, we need enforcement. We need to, you know, so it's like you would expect that all car wash owners would be against all regulation, but that's not the case in the same way that it was true, you know, with uh, railroads during the progressive era, Why? because it, the regulations actually protect them from the guy opening up down the block. Yeah, you've actually got somebody on camera saying thank you for the $15 minimum wage. And that's not somebody who's earning the $15 minimum wage. No, he's a, yeah, he's, that, that's Jack Belinsky, who's a Russian immigrant, very libertarian guy, very smart, and he's an operator of a car wash in Queens. Which, by the way, I don't know if you noticed, I don't name the car wash in the video. Uh, there's a few of them which I couldn't name. Uh, they allowed me in, but they didn't want their name in the story. And that's because, again, these guys are afraid of targeted enforcement. I don't know if it's true. I haven't substantiated these claims, but there are many car wash owners who say that when they've spoken out, when they make political enemies, a month later, the Department of Labor shows up. There's apparently been a six-year effort to unionize the car washes, and that figures into your video. And incidentally, we also see Governor Cuomo talking about 
what we're going to do to improve these people's lives. And you've got brilliantly spliced throughout the video little excerpts from his speeches where he's talking about justice and fairness. But this is interspersed throughout stories of actual individuals who stand to be harmed by these policies. And it, it really, really helps to show how empty the political rhetoric is. But let, let's talk about the unionization, because, of course, unions in general in the U.S. have been very much on the decline for a long time. They do play a major role in this story. And yet, what can we say about that six-year effort to unionize the car washes? I mean, unionizing car washes, I'll give them that. It's quite difficult. These are small businesses scattered around the city. Um, but in 2012, they made a go out of it. They said, you know, the stories you read in the press were, you know, oh, they, you know, they're paid a few dollars a day. They work 70 hours a week. That these, you know, this is really where we're needed in these, uh, to help and save these low wage workers. It's been heavily covered when the, when the campaign started. The New York Times covered it. The Daily News has covered it. I've always gotten annoyed by the, the coverage you know, where they casually use phrases like wage theft to describe when a car wash owner is paying a worker below the minimum wage, they use the word theft, which of course, is just a mutually agreed upon price between two people. Anyway, the other thing that you read reading in these stories is you're always reading about the car washes. Oh, another car wash is unionized, another car wash is unionized. So the reporting, you know, it's like reading the, the birth announcements without reading the obituaries. So I took a close look at what was actually happening with the union campaign. And it's actually been a complete failure. So they unionized 11 car washes total. Two of those car washes have since closed down. Three more, the union perceived that the workers were going to vote the union out. And so the union withdrew voluntarily because it would be embarrassing. So then that brings the number down to six. Then I report on another car wash in Queens where there it's unclear, but it seems like there's a groundswell among the workers against the union. That may drop out as well. And then in two years, when other contracts come out, you may find other workers who are just basically say the union comes, it collects its dues, and it really doesn't do anything for us. So this is, of course, it's never reported on because, again, the Times and the Daily News, and they approach the topic with this bias of evil bosses and exploited workers. It's cartoonish. And the facts don't align. So what then for the casual observer is the lesson of this particular episode and what does it portend for New York's future? I think I'll take the second question first. What it portends for the city's future is that we're moving more and more of these service low-wage industries into the black markets. So that has some consequences and it gives politicians more power because they can be targeted. And it's uh, it has the opposite effect. I mean, New York's politics, its labor enforcement have been a nightmare for a long time. So I think it's really just more of the same. I think there will still be hand washes. I don't think that all of these jobs are going to disappear. And that's because also politicians they don't really want massive across the board enforcement of the minimum wage. They want to talk about it at a, at a press conference, but they will hear from constituents and immigrant communities if, you know, they start really cracking down on people. And again, these are these are like often hand to mouth businesses. The optics aren't always good um, when you actually enforce these rules. So that's on one hand. And then what the lessons are is really that for the most part, Low-wage workers should be negotiating their compensation with their employers, and we don't need a third party getting involved, and they will be better off. And if we want to make them even better off, the right policy is to lower barriers to entry, make it easy for that guy to open a hand wash on the corner. And that's what's going to benefit the workers most of all, because it's going to create new opportunities, and it's going to drive the bad operators out of business faster. And meanwhile, again, strewn throughout this video are, again, in particular, uh, Governor Cuomo, remarks from him that make it sound as if, well, what we have here are people who don't earn as much as we'd like them to earn, and that's an injustice. So we're going to fight that injustice by forcing other people to pay them more, and this will solve the problem. So we'll pass a law that will make them earn more money. And it's just assumed that all right-thinking people would agree that there's perfectly sound logic in this. And meanwhile, you're showing that there's another side to this story, but it's a side that's just not acknowledged. We just wish reality into existence, it seems. 
Yeah, I mean, Cuomo, of course, the governor of New York is a complete opportunist. He'll just, you know, he's, his only interest seemingly is Cuomo. There are other politicians in it as well. I don't talk as much about another politician, a Brooklyn city council member who was likely going to run for mayor named Brad Lander, who was one of the, I opened the video with a, a big protest in front of a car wash where there were two city council members, Brad Lander and Carlos Menchaca, who are actually arrested in front of this car wash in support of the workers. And then Lander wrote a blog post, I, I think the next day, why I was arrested. And it's just the most preening. It's all about Lander. It's like, I stood up for the for the workers because I, in solidarity of their cause, and I believe that the ripple effects of what we did, of course, you know, he was just put in cuffs, probably released 10 minutes late. The idea that he made some big sacrifice, it was just the optics of it. So anyway, that was a car wash called Vegas Auto Spots in Parksville, Brooklyn. Um, and how I closed my video is actually looking at what happened to Vegas Auto Spa, which is that, you know, as soon as the union came, there was a labor lawsuit. This affiliated group called New York Communities for Change went to the owner's house and rioted and scared his kids. They printed out a page from his wife's Facebook page where she's dressed in a Halloween costume and they put it all over the neighborhood. They really went after this guy. And he, he was immediately looking for an exit. He sold it to some guy who didn't know what he's doing, that guy went out of business is the upshot. So today, Vegas Auto Spa is like a garbage dump and there's nobody there. And of course, you know, so back three years ago, this rally where uh, all these politicians are getting arrested made local press, but no one's talking about what happened. What's, what, what's the real world impact of that rally? What are the real ripple effects, as Brad Lander put it? Yeah, and that is what, if we had the kind of journalism we ought to have, that would be the kind of story we would read. But instead, we get the feel-good story about the rally, and then the next day there's something else. And because Again, because it's assumed that our good intentions automatically translate into the policy outcomes we prefer. That's just an, an assumption of the worldview. So there really isn't a reason to follow up because what downside could there be? I mean, it now, I realize with somebody like Cuomo it's just, that you're right, he's an opportunist. It's hard for me to really believe that somebody of his intelligence – I mean I'm not saying he's the smartest guy in the world, but he's not an idiot – actually believes everything he says. Like does he think that people will be less poor if we basically take away their options, which is what this usually amounts to. This job isn't paying them enough, so we'll force it to pay them more. But it usually means they don't have that job anymore. But looking at their entire array of choices, that was the thing they chose. So right. in, pr in practice, you're taking away their choice, and yet you're telling us that's going to improve their condition. Uh, there's something screwy about this. In fact, I even had – I gave a talk once where at the end, a former Bush Labor Department official said to me – because I was talking about – the Catholic bishops who were just hopeless on economics. And he said to me, I find it impossible to believe that those people are people of goodwill. That's the one thing that's impossible. What the only possible explanation is that they know darn well that they're impoverishing people and that this just makes them easier to control. And I, I just, I'm not even sure even I can be cynical enough to go quite that far. I wonder what you think. Well, I think it's a mix. I mean, I, I do think you have true believers um, who are, um, it, it's hard to say. You have people, you have opportunists, you have true believers, and then you have people um, who, I, for example, I wrote another article where, as part of it, um, Scott Stringer, another local politician, I have a source saying that he was telling a group of Korean business owners, don't worry, we're not really going to enforce the $15 minimum wage in thinly veiled language. So to some degree, they're aware that enforcement is weak. So it's like a best of both worlds from their view. They get to, you know, please the powerful labor law lobbies in the in the city which helped them get elected and at the same time um you know the the businesses get to keep running so there's some of that but to what you were saying earlier the simple concept of trade-offs never enters into the picture when they look at these questions so you're wor working at a scrubbing cars all day at a car wash is not it's not a great job. It's not a great way to make. But what what's the alternative? And where does that guy end up when that car wash closes down? And that's the question they never address. Indeed. So I want people to watch your your video. I'll link to it at tomwoods.com slash 1266. So you should definitely watch. And then how do they make sure they get to see future Jim Epstein installments? 
Uh, well, they can subscribe to uh, Reason TV, uh, our YouTube channel, where you can also catch a recent interview with Tom Woods. How about that? Um, yeah, and uh, that's probably the best way. Come subscribe to our YouTube channel. Uh, follow Reason on Facebook. Uh, like us on Facebook because um, we usually post about a video every day or so. Um, and and that's the place to go. Okay, I will link to those things at tomwoods.com slash 1266. And thanks, Jim, and say hi to Gene. Thanks, Tom. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit TomWoods.com to subscribe to the show for free, and we'll see you next time. If the car wash workers can organize, any workers can organize. Si se puede. Si se puede. If you refuse to leave, you will fight on the rest of the in 2015, demonstrators, including union leaders and elected officials, blocked traffic and were arrested in front of a small car wash in Brooklyn. It was an empowering moment. These workers were willing to stand out there to fight for their rights and for basic human dignity. And that's something that you take with you for the rest of your life. And you have the ability to make change by coming together. And when you do that, sometimes you find that you've got some friends on your side. In the past six years, industries like car washes that employ low-skilled workers have been the target of lawsuits for alleged underpayment of wages. And they both engaged in rampant labor law violations. In ambitious unionization drive. Let's hear it for that. And a successful campaign to raise the minimum wage in New York to $15 per hour. We're gonna lead the way, the nation's gonna watch us, and we're gonna raise up this state. But here's what really happened. Instead of helping New York's low-wage workers, the movement is destroying their jobs. It's pushed some car washes to replace their employees with machines and others to close down. Increasingly, workers have no choice but to ply their trade out of illegal vans parked on the street because the minimum wage has made it illegal for anyone to hire them at the going rate. At the same time, businesses that have chosen to automate are benefiting. Thank you so much for $15 an hour, the best thing that could happen to us. Because outlawing cheap labor makes it harder for new competitors to undercut them on price and service. This is an in-depth look at the real-world consequences when politicians interfere with a complex industry that they don't understand, enabled by media coverage that rarely questions their simplistic tale of exploited workers in need of protection. Protect against who? Protect against the king. campaign serves as a model for what might be possible. In 2012, a coalition of progressive groups led by the National Retail Workers Union launched an ambitious campaign to transform New York City's car wash industry. The genesis of the campaign came out of a realization that you had an industry uh, which was really just a, a breeding ground for terrible conditions. Hottest days of the year and the coldest days of the year, these workers are outside working 60, 70 hours a week and sometimes more and not even getting paid the minimum wage. I think workers felt that they didn't have many choices and they really had no one that they could turn to. And we felt that we could have a real impact on, on the industry. But the truth is that almost from day one, nothing about the car wash campaign has gone as planned. For starters, it turns out that most workers don't want help from organized labor. After six years, organizers have unionized 11 businesses, or about 4% of the city's car washes. Two of them have since closed down, and the union withdrew at three more because of a lack of support from the workers. There are just six unionized shops remaining, or about 2% of the city's registered car washes. Irvin Parr is an immigrant from Guatemala who works at Main Street Car Wash in Queens, one of the city's six remaining unionized shops. Organizers have held two strikes at this location in the past few years, and the New York Times has covered allegations of worker mistreatment here. Now Main Street could become the fourth car wash where the workers pressure the union to withdraw. De todos mis compañeros, hay una mayoría que no quieren más la unión. The union says that the workers are exploited and the union needs to protect them. Protect against who? Protect against the king. And at this particular time, we represent the workers there, and um, we um, certainly hope that we'll be able to uh, continue to do that. With the unionization drive floundering, 
the movement's leaders shifted their focus to getting the city and state to mandate change. The most significant government intervention championed by the union was an increase in the minimum wage to $15 per hour. New York is the progressive capital of the nation. We fight for fairness. We fight for justice. This move is upending the industry, but not in the way activists intended. We've heard over the years from employers repeatedly that any time that we've made changes within the industry that either they'd all automate or the industry would suffer massive shutdowns. We haven't seen that happen to date. In reality, that's exactly what's happening. The $15 minimum wage is driving many New York car washes to replace men with machines, such as at this large operation in Queens that installed a new arch for hosing down vehicles which will replace about four workers. Like many of the city's car washes, this one was designed at a time when manual labor costs less than installing and maintaining machinery. Labor was cheap. Yeah, real cheap. Amir Malki is a second generation car wash builder. When he started in the industry in the 1980s, operators all over the city were actually dismantling machinery because rag, hose, and brush wielding men did a better job for less. Today, it's reversing. Labor is expensive, and we need the proper equipment to clean so we don't have to use extra men. It's not just renovations. New fully automated car washes are opening up, such as this state-of-the-art outfit near JFK Airport, with electronic gates, a self-serve vacuum, and a single manager on site, making sure everything is running smoothly. Car wash owners are choosing to automate, even though it entails substantial risk Take Best Auto Spa in Brooklyn, one of the city's premier hand washes, drawing clients who care deeply about the appearance of their cars and are willing to pay more for the human touch. The $15 minimum wage means that this business model is simply no longer viable, so Best Auto Spa is transforming from the equivalent of an artisanal bistro to becoming just another fast food joint. Two years ago, the owner installed $200,000 worth of equipment, which allowed him to lay off eight workers. Now he's facing another policy change that would further increase his labor costs. Employers are currently allowed to attribute a portion of the tips earned by their workers towards meeting the minimum wage requirement. New York State is seriously considering a proposal to eliminate the so-called tip credit. If that happens come January, the owner of Vegas Auto Spa says he'll have no choice but to give all these employees a pink slip and go fully automated. Then you have M.M. Wonder Bar, Church Avenue. You have new fully automated places opening up, like City Car Wash Express on Northern Boulevard in Staten Island. I could go on. What is your take on these examples, which I think do actually show a major trend towards automation? I get it if you go into a car wash and an owner has said, I've automated because of what's going on here, that it makes you think that it's like, you know, part of a, a much broader story. I'm not saying it isn't the case. I'm just saying that it's like that might not necessarily be the case. It's true that not every car wash owner is willing to take on the risk and expense of automation. And there's another option. Exit the business and relinquish their land for more profitable uses, which has also been happening at many New York car washes. Several car washes have closed after their owners were sued for paying off the books and not complying with labor regulations. We will continue to keep an eye on these businesses to ensure that they don't stray from the path of righteous business practices. A lawsuit contributed to the closing of this car wash in Woodside, Queens, to this one in Harlem, and to this one in Upper Manhattan. At each of these locations, dozens of low-wage jobs disappeared. Are workers really better off when the car wash that they work for closes down? Yeah, I don't agree with your assessment that these car washes are closing as a result of, of wage and hour lawsuits. Um, that's, um, that might not necessarily be the case. That may be how it's being characterized to you. Another unintended consequence is that for business owners who choose to stick it out and automate, the $15 minimum wage actually protects them from competition by making it harder for new car washes to open up. Solely from being a businessman, the increase in the minimum wage makes my business so much easier. The best thing that could happen to me and I think to the industry. Jack Belinsky is the manager of a new car wash in Queens. It opened last year at the site of yet another labor-heavy operation that closed following a wage and hour lawsuit. The new owner converted it to a fully automated exterior-only car wash, meaning customers are left to vacuum the interiors of their own vehicles. 
because we used to do the same thing with 25 people. Now I'm doing it with two. By making cheap labor illegal, the $15 minimum wage made it possible for Belinsky to downgrade his service. Before, if I go exterior and my competition says, ah, he went exterior and I'm still free service, I'll take all his customers. That never gave me a chance to go exterior. Right now, everybody is forced to go exterior because of this crazy law and the minimum wage $15 an hour. Now everybody it evened out the, the field. The $15 minimum wage amounts to government prohibition of low-wage work. And yet, just making something illegal won't stop able-bodied men with few alternatives from meeting a market demand for their services. These workers have few options and little power. They live in the shadows. The irony is that progressives have pushed car wash workers further into the shadows. Since legitimate car washes can no longer hire them, workers are going to the streets where it's all cash, no taxes, no unions, no workers' comp, no insurance, and certainly no wage floors. Fausto, who asked to be identified by his first name only, is an illegal car wash worker. He's part of a three-man operation washing cars on the curb out of a van for about $15 a pop. Los clientes nos prefieren a nosotros por, por esa situación, porque vienen con una manchita de, de la ave, de lo que sea, nosotros la quitamos. La máquina le pasa, si no la quitó, por ahí mismo tú te vas. He's lived in the U.S. for 19 years and still sends a portion of his earnings back to the Dominican Republic to help support his wife and children. Semanal o cada 15 días mando 100 dólares para la comida y, y de ahí algo, algunos gastos más. Le estoy cubriendo la novicidad de aquí. How the hell can you, how can I compete? Because of these guys, they're paying, they're paying cash. You understand? They're not paying the proper taxes, FICA, uninsured, but I am. And now the established car washes, left with no choice but to install expensive machines and plaster their walls with operating licenses, are the ones clamoring for the government to enforce the minimum wage. We worry for the workers. Look at the rules that we make. But if those rules are not enforced, those laws are toothless. They only destroy the good guy that tries to follow of all the rules and has to compete with the bad guy that breaks all the rules. No tenía otra opción ya de trabajar. Otra opción de trabajar que es la más que uno puede encontrar más fácil. Some of these guys working out of these vans don't have other employment options. Are you sure that it would be in their best interest to shut them down. Yeah, I, I actually, I, I, I do. And I'm going to be very blunt about that. You can always make the argument that you can allow some people to skirt the law, some people to skirt regulations that are meant to protect workers in an effort to give people work opportunities. That's a devil's bargain. Or maybe the real devil's bargain is championing a set of policies that sound good at a rally, but that in the real world jeopardize the livelihoods of the working poor. Which brings us back to Vegas Auto Spa, the Brooklyn car wash that progressive activists made an example of back in 2015. Shortly after the car wash unionized, the owner started planning his exit strategy. Two years later, he found a buyer who kept it running for one more year. Today, Vegas Auto Spa is shuttered, and the ripple effects of the entire movement have been to destabilize an industry, pushing the men and women who worked in it even deeper into the shadows.